Thank you very much, Professor Sachs. A great honor to be here. As an economist, you understand how science and technology impact how we work, how we connect, how we communicate. We've been talking a lot about AI at this eighth edition of FII. Could you give us a historical context around how previous technological advances have impacted the global economy? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, great to be together with you and with, with everybody. I think if you look at uh, that envisioned uh, shop floor of some kind of manufacturing facility, uh, we get a, a message. There's no person there, evidently. And if you walk through a, a modern uh, automobile assembly plant, that's pretty much what you would see. Uh, a vast, uh, uh, very uh, functional, uh, huge space with almost nobody in it. So we've been at this uh, automation issue for at least half a century, and AI is going to accelerate that. What have we learned from that experience? Well, we learned that, uh, of course, these technologies dramatically raised productivity as we measure it, output per worker, but also tremendously changed the distribution of income and eliminated a vast swath of jobs. And so the consequences are very significant already uh, during the last 50 years. Uh, and they are that uh, there has been uh, a huge shift of income distribution in the United States and other high income countries, for example, away from high school graduates to university graduates. The education premium widened tremendously. Why? Because the workers that used to work on the assembly line with a high school degree didn't have jobs anymore. Of course, our politicians blame it on China or they blame it on some other reason, but it's actually technology that has been driving this for the last 50 years. That's the fundamental factor. It's created uh, a lot of uh, income rise for lucky people. It's created a lot of stress for declining communities. And what I would say, Jerry, is AI is going to dramatically accelerate this. Uh, we're not, and so this, the topic here is very good, but the idea that it's, it's all a plus is absolutely not correct. There will be lots of losers as well as lots of winners. We don't know, it's, it's really hard to figure out uh, actually ex ante before we see what these technologies can really do, what the consequences would be. But we heard Elon Musk yesterday, if he's right, uh, that uh, his Optimus, uh, by its uh, third or fourth generation at the end of this decade, can do anything we can do, um, wages will plummet for most people. Elon, who is now worth $280 billion this morning, will be worth some trillions. Most of the rest of us uh, will be worth very little indeed, thank you. And uh, the social consequences uh, will be very complicated. So I think uh, <laughs> we're in for very big changes is how I see it. Uh, maybe they won't be the next year, the next five years, but if you look 10 to 20 years, this is a very, very significant change ahead. So you're, you're feeling this as an investor, as a, uh, a national planner. Let me throw the question back to you. <laughs> what, do you what do you see coming? Um, unevenness. I mean, if you look at how technology gets adopted, um, you know, at the, the city, the state, uh, the country level, but also at the firm level, um, uh, it's uneven. Um, uh, you know, it's a function of uh, motivation, it's a function of uh, agility at the organizational level, um, and then of course uh, resourcing, are, are the resources there. Um, the prize is large uh, for those that can move quickly, that adopt early. Uh, if you take an example of uh, supply chain innovations, in the 90s Walmart had a 10-year lead uh, because they adopted early and at scale, um, and others worked hard to catch up. Um, and so you could imagine the same thing happening in 
um, uh, in this space as well. And uh, when you think about the challenge on the resourcing side, uh, that's not just capital, it's also uh, the people that actually know how to, to leverage this technology. Um, and that brings in education as, 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 as a very important vector for, at the national level, uh, for par preparing citizens. You've been in education uh, for uh, a, a long time. Um, how do you see the way we learn, you know, the way we teach, uh, what we teach, uh, evolving because of AI? Again, <coughs> uh, there, there's a, a lot of fog uh, here because we don't really uh, know. I would say the, the curriculum at uh, schools and universities has not changed. Uh, anywhere near as rapidly as the uh, technology has changed, so we're behind the curve. When you talk about unevenness, <coughs> there are only a few places in the world that are at the cutting edge of this, uh, perhaps a few parts of the United States, I would say uh, several parts of China, not very many other places right now. So if it was 10 years uh, lead time for Walmart, we've got uh, a very considerable lead time of a few regions, uh, and most of the rest of the world is way behind. When it comes to education, by the way, I'm, I'm concerned with even the most basic fact, which is there are hundreds of millions of kids, including no doubt tens of millions in this region who are school age and not in school at all. So it's not even a matter of uh, what they are learning or not learning, they're not even in school. And I'm working a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, probably 250 million school-age kids are not in school because the governments are too poor to keep them in school. The households have no income. And so where are they going to be in 10 or 20 years? So the answer is, uh, of course, we're going to have to train for uh, much more flexible uh, lives because the content of jobs will change a lot in the future. I don't think anybody can predict exactly what uh, people are going to be doing, what any of us will be doing in 10 or 15 years because machines will be able to do a, a lot of what we currently do and uh, what we will be doing will be something quite different. So education is vital it's going to have to be education for flexibility and for quality of human life, but not education that is specifically targeted to a particular skill, most likely, because that skill, if you can teach it, you can probably train your optimist humanoid robot to do the same thing in about three hours, what it would take to train us four years. So we, we're going to have a real challenge in, in this question. Uh, and uh, I think this whole idea of how do we prepare for this, which is the whole purpose uh, of this conference, uh, is um, re really an important question. You're in the public sector, which I think is critical for this. Uh, how do you see the role of the public sector? And of course, the private sector is the owner of the technology. So what's the public sector to do in this? I think partnerships are a very important part of the playbook. Um, things are moving very fast. It's hard for any one node in the system to have all the information required about what's happening, what's changing, uh, and to be able to predict what's needed in the future. And so I think um, uh, government, not just governments, uh, I think really everyone in the system needs to have a very strong external orientation uh, where you're not only keeping an eye open to what's happening, uh, but also partnering with people so that your organization learns uh, and so that you can adapt. Um, one of the things that's happened over the past, you know, 40 years with globalization is jobs have moved to different places. Uh, with the ri rise of remote work, that can happen in a unit of one uh, in a way that where in the past, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily a possibility. I know this is something you've thought a bit about. What's, what's the opportunity for global business uh, when it comes to tapping into, you know, labor forces and in other parts of the world uh, in a way that they perhaps wouldn't have been able to do quite as easily in the past? Well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, working from anywhere, because I do. I shouldn't say this in front of people, but I don't go to my office anymore. Um, it's been quite a while. Uh, one of my colleagues is here. He knows that, but um, uh, 
you really can work from anywhere for certain kinds of work. And this could have an enormously positive effect on our lives because many young people, traditionally in this region or in a very poor regions, say, I need to get skills, then I'm going to move to the United States or move to Britain or move to uh, the Gulf or move uh, someplace else uh, for, for work. And of course, that's been a kind of uh, life approach. But I'm of the view that people should be educated, have skills, and then work from anywhere for anywhere. And if we could do that, if we could really design that, people could live in their home places where they have their families, their loved ones. They could be engaged in world activities of all sorts of uh, creative, constructive, remunerative uh, dimensions. And to my mind, that would make a, a much, much better world. But this morning, I was hearing from colleagues about so many educated young people in certain parts of West Africa who have no jobs right now, so they're trying to leave. What's wrong with our global labor markets that we can't have the kind of uh, online constructive and creative work? My guess is we can, but it needs to be designed. I think one of the lessons of technology in general is it doesn't just come for free on a platter, you use it, and that's the outcome you shape it also in terms of societal objectives. And this technology is coming faster than anything we've ever seen because who here thought about these issues five or 10 years ago? Maybe people in this room, but not most of the people in the world. AI was not exactly on the tip of everybody's tongue, but now it is the center of everybody's attention. This is an incredibly, incredibly rapid development and we are way behind at all levels in dealing with it. You know, Elon, again, a friend, I think he's a genius uh, in, inventor uh, and innovator. He said yesterday, we have the age of abundance ahead of us. I'd say, Elon, it's easy to say when you have $200 billion, $280 billion, excuse me, in your bank account. But what about somebody that is, whose job is uh, going to go away and you and your friends don't want any government programs anymore? Uh, what's going to happen to them? And so we need to think about this truly in a collective way to meet the basic idea that this really needs to help all parts of society and all parts of the world. I, I'm asking you, uh, you know, how can we do that because you're uh, leading an effort of for the kingdom, and I think the kingdom is absolutely determined to be in a global forefront on these issues. So how do we think ahead on this? Uh, I won't answer uh, from the perspective of my day job. Uh, that is very much focused on building out sectoral ecosystems that create meaningful jobs and you know, for future generations. Uh, but if you think about the potential of AI um, to uh, create segments of one to personalize things to a level um, uh, where uh, it's, it, it understands what you need. I'm hoping that same thing applies to jobs, right? So if there's that engineer in West Africa who has talent but doesn't today have an employer nearby, um, that, uh, you know, capitalism ultimately will find ways, you know, for that talent to be connected uh, to, to people who need that, um, with the managerial innovations required actually coming from AI, uh, uh, which can happen at a much faster rate, as you said, uh, than businesses can adapt and HR departments can adapt and everything else. So that's the promise that we're all uh, hoping for. Professor Zaks, thank you very much for this conversation. That's a, a great idea, by the way. I support it. Thank you.